Okay, uh, so hello everyone. My name is Leo Gibas from Stanford University. And in this part of the course, I'll talk about functional map synchronization and its applications. A brief outline of the talk is here. I'm gonna focus on maps and correspondences between visual data such as uh, images or 3D models. We'll then develop a functional representation for such maps. I'll explain what this means. And then we'll build networks of functional maps that connect different data sets and show how to synchronize the maps. And finally, we'll discuss uh, how such, such an approach helps to both you know, clean up the maps and also leads to the emergence of shared semantic abstractions between the data in purely unsupervised ways. I think we all know what's shown here. This is a uh, deep nets, we normally draw them horizontally, but in fact, I think it's best to think of them vertically, as I show uh, here on the right, because uh, such a network really processes data at different abstraction levels, starting from low level features, intermediate level features, and high level features. So such a network processes a single piece of data across abstraction layers, but today, instead, I wanna focus on networks that process different data sets at the same abstraction layer through a notion of a connection that comes from similarity. That is, if somehow the uh, sofa on the left is similar to the sofa on the right, and I know something about the sofa on the left, maybe this information I can transfer to the sofa on the right. Of course, this transfer is not always perfect. Uh, so it's very much like classical communication theory because the channel is noisy. The channel is noisy because uh, for example, these two chairs are not exactly the same. So not everything transfers. Some things will uh, not. And also the transfer process itself can have errors. So the goal is to talk about uh, information transport between visual data. Like I show here, here's a bunch of airplane images or connected into a network. We'll be developing such networks later in this lecture. One can also have networks of 3D models or maybe mixed networks that combine images and 3D. And uh, the point is these networks are real networks. They are not just graphs uh, connecting images by some similarity metric, but as we will see each of these gray links that you see here connecting two of these aeroplanes is really a mechanism for transporting you know, information and semantic knowledge between these images. And these are the networks we'll try to synchronize. Uh, so in, in some ways this is related to the other part of the course where we have multiple views of an object in, you know, in the real world and try to synchronize them. We can do so because there's a single object out there and the different views clearly have to be related by camera transforms. Here we don't have views of a single object. We have perhaps views of many different objects that are related. And still we want to synchronize them. And the question is, what is the corresponding thing in the middle that corresponds to the real object here? And as we will see, certain abstractions can emerge from the network. For many cow images, we can build a cow abstraction. It's not any particular cow, but it's a more general notion of what a cow looks like from the image or appearance point of view. The point is that uh, in interpreting one piece of data, we can be aided by understanding how it relates to similar pieces of data. For example, if we are segmenting the human form shown here on the left, many algorithms will miss the neck because it's not such a prominent part of the anatomy of a human. On the other hand, if, if I'm segmenting the human in the context of many other mammals, that have prominent necks like uh, you know, horses, dogs, and so on, and if I understand the structural connections between the human and these animals, then the importance of the animal necks transfers over to the human, and I don't miss the, the human neck. So this is the central notion we pursue. We have uh, a collection of uh, data with some partial similarities, and we would like somehow to process them so that we find shared structure among them. And so this, uh, this, this for example, natural shape parts, the seats, the backs, the legs, just arise out of the network because they are the most efficient way for the network to, uh, you know, to route these maps and correspondences, as we will see. 
So the notion is we will develop social networks of visual data, very much like social networks of people. And this can be used to transport information around the network. They can also be used to assess the validity of operations on the data, for example, segmentation, as we discussed in the previous slide. And also to assess the maps themselves. This will be the synchronization part we'll discuss and to extract shared structure. The bottom line is that the network becomes the great regularizer for everything we do in what I would call you know, joint data analysis. We analyze sets of related data together, not separately. Key to all of this is uh, defining and being able to manipulate maps. Maps uh, denote relationships at multiple scales. For example, for images, we can have a pixel-to-pixel -pixel mapping shown here between this two view of the Gates building at Stanford or at the point level between this, these two different points of the Armadillo. Maps can also be at a higher abstraction level, for example, at the level of parts as between these two aeroplanes that are not the same aeroplane, but still have a very well-defined correspondences between their parts. In general, maps capture what is the same or similar across two data sets. And there's been lots and lots of work on doing matching between images or between uh, uh, shapes or between graphs, um, mostly to develop some notions of similarity. But in our world, we are interested in these maps and correspondences because they can be used to transport information. Maps are information transporters. That's the main use we will make of them. And in computer graphics, for example, there's a lot of work on transferring texture and parametrization from one model to another, transferring segmentation and labels, and transferring deformation or motion. And I want to use this little schematic to show why maps are essentially more powerful than just a similarity metric. I show here these three schematic shapes. And on the top, A is half the same as B, and B is half the same as C, but A and C are completely different. On the bottom, A is half the same as B, and B is half the same as C, but A and C are exactly the same. But from the point of view of a similarity metric, the top row and the bottom row look identical. See, so if all you know is just a single number that summarizes the relation of two complex objects, being able to aggregate information across multiple edges is quite challenging. But if you have a more detailed understanding of the relationship between two objects, as for example here that A and B share this part, and that B and C share this part, and therefore by sensitivity, A and C share this part, then this information integration becomes a lot easier, and that's a key advantage of maps. So now let's try to do this in a bit more of a technical way. Uh, I'll be talking about functions on data, functions on images, and functions on 3D models. And we're all familiar with such functions. For example, on a 3D model, we know about curvature. That's a function on the shape. On images, we have lots and lots of different descriptors, for example, shift features, and so on. But also parts of images or shapes can be thought of as functions. For example, this leg, the left leg of the armadillo is just a zero one function that's one on this leg and zero elsewhere and we'll be interested in operators things that take input as fun take functions as input and give other functions as output and we'll be using quite a quite a bit the laplace beltrami operator for manifolds this is defined by the heat equation uh, essentially it's the um, uh, this thing here, the, the divergence of the gradient and its um, eigenfunctions are natural functional basis for a 3D shape tend to align well with uh, semantic features of the shape. And so we'll try to represent essentially knowledge over data as functions of the data that includes features, parts, and so on. And we'll try to map this knowledge towers to each other. And that's this notion of functional maps, maps between function spaces, that takes traditional correspondences that are a little bit hard to, to express and take them to a much nicer representation mathematically, that of a matrix. Here is how this works. Um, we start with a point-to-point -point map, say from the uh, lion to the cat, that maps, say, tips of the ears to tips of the ears, end of the tail to end of the tail, nose to nose, and so on. 
And now we translate that into a functional map by considering functions of the two animals. And if we have a function on the cat painted here by the color shown, then I can transfer this function to the, uh, to the lion. Because for every point of the lion, I can apply the forward map, get a point of the cat, and then copy the cat color to the lion. Here I show four different colorings of the cat and their transfer to the lion. And what I'm describing now is a functional map, a map from functions of the cat to functions of the lion. And that's what mathematically would be called a contravariant functor because it goes in the other direction. If the primal map goes in one direction, the, the functional map goes in the other direction. And so it maps a function space over the first space, over the first uh, shape to a function space over the second shape. And it so happens, and it's actually rather easy to show, this, uh, oops, these functional maps are always linear. No matter how complicated, non-linear, non-convex the primal map is, this dual map is always linear. Somehow it's a bit like the, uh, the kernel situation in machine learning, the kernel trick. By going to a higher dimensional space, we are able to buy a linearity. So again, this is the basic setting. We have a map between two manifolds or two images or two spaces. And then we get a dual map that maps functions over the range to functions over the domain. So the um, a functional map, F to F map, is dual from the point to point or P to P map. And uh, to express it, we need some kind of a set of basis functions on the, of the function space. We, you know, we borrow here heavily ideas from cluster analysis. Uh, we all know about, say, Fourier basis for functions on the line. And instead, we will use, uh, as I mentioned, the Laplace Beltrami eigenfunctions, which are a basis of the L2 functional space over a shape. And so, for us, a function will be a linear combination of the basis eigenfunctions, and then a map from, say, the, the human to Homer. To, to define that, we have to know how to apply, because of linearity, we can push the functional map inside. So we have to know how to apply the functional map to each of the eigenfunctions of, of Homer. So basically, we have to fill in this matrix that is, um, uh, you know, if we take a function on the human, we want to know what is the coefficient of that after transfer, given this eigenfunction on the Homer. So formally now, uh, each of our uh, functions, A and B say, one on M, one on N, are given by a vector of coefficients on the functional basis. And we're looking for an unknown matrix C that takes this vector to this. And this is a classic uh, linear algebra uh, formulation. And the elements of E of this ma matrix C, as I mentioned, is what happens if you take the inner product of a basis function on the domain, transpose it over to the right, and then take the inner product with some other basis function on the right. Okay? These are the entries of this matrix uh, shown here. The idea entry of this matrix is exactly this. So you take the eigenfunction on the human, move it over to Homer, and dot it with the j eigenfunction on Homer. Okay. So this gives us now a representation of maps <coughs> as linear operators, and therefore as matrices, because <coughs> even though formally these functional spaces are silver spaces, they are infinite dimensional, in any real setting we will truncate the representation because the Laplace Beltrami uh, again, basis is, is hierarchical, so we capture most of the variation on the shape by taking the first of n eigenfunctions. And so if we truncate, then the functional map is just a normal matrix, and the map composition becomes matrix multiplication. And in fact, as we will see, we can represent maps very compactly using this matrix form. And even more than that, natural mappings tend to be very sparse matrices, I show an example here where I'm mapping this cat to these other versions of the same cat, and the coloring tries to indicate what the map is. This is the identity map. And you would expect to get exactly a diagonal matrix. You don't because of the truncation. And this is the identity map, but with a symmetry. 
exchanging the left and the right. And again, this is essentially a perfect map, the same as this. But if you take a very unnatural map, where that maps the tail shown here in green, and the head shown here in uh, also green, this map tends to be dense because it's not a natural mapping between those two shapes. So we like uh, sparse functional maps. And note that uh, a functional map is not just a representation, can also be an, become an algorithm for computing a map. Because if I have, you know, normally when we compute maps between shapes or images, we try to find corresponding pixels or corresponding points. But here we can use corresponding functions. So for example, if I have two poses of the armadillo, maybe some function on the left pose, like the curvature, should correspond to some other function on the right, like the curvature. And this gives me now, so now these two functions are known, they correspond to vectors in the Laplace Beltrami basis, A and B, and I'm looking for a matrix C that maps A to B. And if I take enough such pairs, then we can solve the least square system to recover the functional map. <coughs> and what can I use for my descriptors? Well, really any, any descriptor. I mean, we can, yeah, I mentioned Gaussian curvature, there's classic things like spin images, the head kernel, the heat kernel signature, the wave kernel signature. One can use landmark correspondences. How? Well, points are delta functions. So you are mapping one delta function to another delta function. Or maybe you take a distance function and you map it to the corresponding distance function. You can also have part correspondences. The left arm of the armadillo is uh, a zero one function of the armadillo and that should map to the corresponding zero one function on the other part of the armadillo and so on and so on. This is where we impose certain supervision on the functional map by indicating which are these functions that we care to preserve. So we call these the probe functions. <clears throat> In addition, we can try to preserve certain higher level uh, invariances. Um, so as to regularize the map, for example, many 3D shapes have uh, left to right symmetry. And a symmetry is a self map. It's a map from the source to itself and a map from the destination to itself. Because it's a it's, it's self map, it's just a functional form mapping the function space of the domain to itself. And similarly in the range, mapping the function space of the range to itself. So if we want the map to preserve symmetries, what this means is that we want this diagram to commute. That is, if we apply a symmetry on the domain and then map, that should be the same as first mapping and then applying a symmetry on the range. So in terms of the matrices, what this says is that we should have this equation or we should minimize this norm. And notice here that the unknown is only C, S1 and S2 are the known symmetry. So, so again, this is a linear constraint on C. So we can throw that into the uh, pool for the least squares. And in fact, many other uh, uh, high levels of relationships have the same form, for example, to, uh, to preserve isometry, which is quite important when looking at, say, the formations of a human or animal-like object. It turns out that just corresponds to the functional map commuting with the Laplacian on the left and on the right. So differentiating and then transporting should be the same as transporting and then differentiating. And again, that is delta one and delta two are known quantities, known you know, operators, known matrices, and this gives us a linear constraint or C. And it gets more challenging, but one can do also angle preservation for conformal maps and also uh, you know, volume preservation. This is not a, a linear constraint that's quadratic, but can, be, but can be enforced as an additional loss. Also, as I mentioned, we offer what sparsity because we like uh, sparse functional maps, maps that use a localized basis as much as possible. I will not discuss any details here, just to give the overall framework of computing this map. So given, say, the two shapes M and N, we compute the first 100 eigenfunctions of both and store them as matrices. And then we have some set of probe functions, some descriptors, like your heat kernel signatures on M and N that we want to preserve. And again, we express this as matrices in terms of the basis functions. And now we are solving this optimization problem shown here where we are trying to minimize the number of errors. One of them is the preservation of descriptors that C applied to A should give B. 
And then we have this regular items that I mentioned. In this case, I added the asymmetry uh, one, the one that says I should commute with the Laplacian so as to preserve length. And by solving this optimization problem, we obtain a functional map. And then, of course, we have to convert that back to a point to point map to finish the job. That itself is a little bit interesting of how to convert uh, the functional map to a point to point map. Um, essentially, we'd like to, to find if I take a delta function on the left, what is the corresponding delta function on the right? Now, I don't really expect to be able to uh, get a perfect delta function through because I have truncated my basis. But what's interesting is that applying the, um, the functional form of a delta function is exceedingly simple. It's simply the value of the basis on the source at that point at which you want to compute the delta function. So really what we're trying to do here is to take this um, uh, and well, if I go back, I mean, you can view these things as a lifted image of point X from free space to this higher dimensional functional space. So, the, so what we are doing is we are taking the images of the points of M lifted in the functional space, and we want to find C such so as to transport them to the images of the point in N to their functional space. So now we have estimated C we can do the transport and maybe it's not perfect. So we can, for every transported point of M, we can just look for the nearest point of M. We can use essentially nearest neighbor search to, um, to, uh, to find the one-to-one -one correspondence. And this starts to sound familiar because this is exactly doing ICP in the functional space. So for every point, for every transformed point of M, we find the nearest point of N up in the high functional space, and then we apply some rigid motion in the high functional space to bring them closer and repeat, and this improves the correspondences. Uh, I show here how the errors in a map, so essentially you take a functional map, you convert it back to point to point, and compare it to a ground truth map, but in terms of the geodesic distance between the ground truth map. So, so for every point you take its ground truth image, you also take its functional image and you see how far these are. And the question is what fraction of this do you capture uh, with, a, with a particular number of eigenfunctions. And you see here a fairly sharp knee, meaning that with a small number of eigenfunctions, we already get very good results. In fact, in practice, we barely go over the 200 say, eigenfunctions. And so, this means really this, this very complicated mapping that would be a huge thing to write in a point of format because these cuts may have you know, 50 or 100,000 vertices can now be written as 200 by 200 matrices. And this becomes a state-of-the-art algorithm for, uh, for computing uh, maps between uh, shapes. What's interesting is that you can compute such maps with a very small number of functional correspondences maybe only 10, you have to give one that uh, differentiates left to right for the animal cases. Otherwise, the symmetry means that the functional map will essentially average the map that you want and the symmetric one. Because again, functional maps are more general. They can represent soft mappings that send one point to, to many other points. All right, this is a very quick uh, introduction to functional maps. And I just want to mention also that they can be used without conversion to point-to-point -point form in many applications. For example, if I want to transfer a segmentation from this human to this human, I can take a zero-one function on the segments of this human, transport them to the other form by a functional map. Of course, they will not be quite sharp because of the truncated basis. There will be fuzziness around the, the boundaries. But if I do this for all of them, and then for every point of this human, I pick the segment that gives the highest value, I do get a very good uh, segmentation, which is the transport of the segmentation to this form. Now let me look at consistency of network transport and get to synchronization. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, maps are information transporters. And if you look at, a, at more than a pair, say these different human poses connected by different maps, and 
and I show here this uh, coordinate systems as the function space over these humans, then I can transport information from this human to this human via this path. I can also transfer it via this path. For, for example, I can take the zero one function that's the head of this human and transfer it here, transfer it there, transfer it there. I'll get some function that tells you me where the head is here. I can also do it following this path. And the question is, will I get the same result? Well, in the ideal case, I should, because after all, if the functional maps cap capture notions of sameness or, or of equality, and uh, uh, equality is transitive, it should be the same. But of course, in practice, it is not, because maps are noisy and they're truncated and so on. So here we have something interesting, because uh, we would like to have path invariance or cycle closure, and if we don't have it, then we can try to, to enforce it. In other words, we can try to perturb the maps so they're more consistent. This is map synchronization, and it's a kind of map processing, the same way that we have image processing or geometry processing, we can have map processing. And as you will see in another talk, in this workshop, it's possible to recover the correct map, even if a lot of it is corrupted. How do you fix maps? Well, let's think of this example of uh, taking a pig to a horse. Uh, and I show here in the in the point to point form, not in the functional form, because it's easier to visualize. But the same ideas apply in the functional form. Well, here there are some errors. On the other hand, if we introduce an you know this other object, the cow, that somehow between the pig and uh, the horse and compute uh, maps between these respective pairs. These tend to have fewer errors because they are more similar. So now we can compose them and get another map from uh, the uh, pig to the horse, which has fewer errors than the original. Because in general, uh, the mapping problem is easier the more similar the source and target are. And more generally, if we have, say, a group of n objects, and think of this big mapping matrix where the xij entry is a block that indicates how you map object i to object j. If we had if we had perfect path invariance or loop closure, so going around any loop it gives, it gives us the identity, or going between any two nodes by two different paths gives the same result. It turns out. That's a very, very, very strong condition on this matrix. Extremely strong. This matrix has to be low rank because of all these dependencies the cycle closure path invariance introduces. It also has to be positive semi definite. And this means now we can use uh, traditional linear algebra low rank techniques to clean up functional maps and to extract shared structure. So, in the ideal case, our huge matrix simply factorizes into this much smaller matrices, this and its transpose. What it really says is that we are uh, essentially factorizing every map from i to j by going, say, through object one. So to go from i to j, you go from j to one, and then from, uh, from one, sorry, you go from i to one, and then from one to j. Um, and if we can do this perfectly, we don't need all this thing. We just need this. So this is a much, much smaller object of much smaller dimension and rank. And essentially, we are trying to approximate this kind of perfect factorization. And if everything is perfect, then of course, any object can be used as the, as the waypoint. It makes no difference. So let's see how this arises in practice. And I will start with an example with images, where I give a bunch of images and I want to co-segment them. It's a classic problem in computer vision. I, uh, I have these images of this red Ferrari. I want to find where the Ferrari is in the images. But also more generally, I give you a bunch of cow images. I want to find where the cows are in these images. And uh, the question really is, how does knowing where the cow is in this image help you know where the cow is in that image? Well, so we start by building a network that connects these images. Uh, we can connect all of them together in a, in a complete graph, if we, don't, if we don't have so many. If we have many, well, we use some classical image similarity metric like GIST and uh, connect each image to its, say, 30 nearest neighbors. 
and this gives us a sparse graph on the images. Now we have to develop functional spaces over the images, and in the work I will show you, we use superpixels as opposed to pixels. So we break each image up into little homogeneous regions, as I show here, 200 of them to be exact. And this, where these pixels always form a regular grid, the superpixels also form a graph. You can think of each superpixel as a node connected to its neighbors by some edge. And we can put a, a weight on that edge according to how long the shared boundary is. Uh, so now we have a graph and we'll be interested in functions over this graph, that is functions that give a value to each node of the graph. This is the functional space we'll work with. And so every function we'll describe in terms of the eigenfunctions of the graph Laplacian, as shown here. And in practice, because we're interested in pretty large objects in the images and not so much fine detail, it turns out we can reconstruct these large objects pretty well without using all 200 eigenfunctions. We can get by with 30. So in what follows, each function will be really a, a, a set of 30 coefficients that are the coefficients for the first 30 eigenfunctions of the corresponding graph Laplacian. Okay, well, and now we'll look at functional maps between images, well, actually between these graphs. And on these graphs, we have a number of probe functions. I'll tell you what they are. And we're looking for this mapping matrices X, I, J, shown here by this, uh, this blue uh, square. And what you see here is some examples of uh, probe functions computed on the source and on the destination. And we would like essentially this matrix to transfer this to this and transfer this to that and transfer this to this and transfer this to that. And again, each function is a vector of length uh, 30. Each XIJ is a 30 by 30 ma matrix. The particular uh, the probe functions we use are very standard computer vision descriptors. We have RGB color, the average for the superpixel, some histogram of color, and then some swift bug of words based feature that has most of the dimensions. So I think these two come from this. They are different dimensions of a histogram color. I guess this captures more of the greens and this captures more of the browns. And these are some of the bug of words, uh, you know, digital fixtures. You can see they tend to focus on the legs of the cow or maybe some of the uh, other cows in the distance. And we're looking for these functional maps that will transport the scriptures from image I the descriptors of image J. We add a regularizer, which is this commutation with the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Lambda I is a diagonal matrix that has the eigenvalues of the Laplacian of I on the, on the left, and L, lambda J is the corresponding thing for image J. And this tries to keep the matrix diagonal tries to say that every eigenfunction on the left should be transported to a sparse combination of eigenfunctions on the right. It should have comparable support on the right. Okay, that's all well and good. But the real meat here is how to, to enforce uh, path invariance or cycle consistency. We would like, if we go around any cycle, the function f should come back to itself. And this is a very demanding thing because, first of all, a graph can have an exponential number of cycles. Even if we take short cycles like uh, triangles, there can be a cubic number of them. And furthermore, the unknowns here are the entries of these X matrices. And so we're multiplying them. So basically, even in the three cycle case, we will get cubics, I mean, cubic products out of multiplying three matrices. And this looks very, very challenging. So to explain what's going on here, let me take a little detour. To guarantee cycle consistency, I would like to factorize the map between any two cows through some ideal object. I mean, after all, I'm trying to find the common 
the commonness between these images, very much like in the uh, traditional synchronization problem, the different views are of the same object in 3D. Here it's some object in some other space, sort of Plato's ideal cow. So I'm going to factorize the map between this cow image and this cow image as a map to the ideal object and then back from the ideal object, like this. And if I can do that, then actually I will get cycle closure for free because for any cycle like I show here going around, I can always substitute going to the ideal and coming back, going to the ideal and coming back, going to the ideal and coming back. And everything here will telescope and cancel because for every edge I'm traversing it yeah, once in one direction and once in the other direction and it should cancel. Now, of course, these are not really the same cow in, the, in this background that's different. So to allow for some error, we make this, so these Y maps to allow some loss. So while the XIJs are 30 by 30, we allow the Ys to be 30 by 20. And so to guarantee the cycle closure, essentially, we're trying to, to find not only these XIJs, but also these YIs that play well with the XIJs. And we put more weight in this preservation for strong edges in the graph for very similar you know, images. So now we can put everything together into a global optimization problem where we have the feature preservation, the regularization, and then the consistency theorem. And of course, to avoid trivial solutions, we require the Y matrices to be orthogonal. Otherwise, a zero Y would satisfy everything. So notice in this uh, formulation, we are computing the functional maps altogether. It's not that I compute functional maps between pairs first and then try to enforce consistency. Rather, I compute everything at once. And of course, because of this condition, that's not a convex problem, but I can solve it by alternation. Namely, if I fix the maps to the ideal, it turns out this completely factorizes into separate quadratic programming problems for each of the x's pairwise. So this is a uh, uh, standard. And if I fix x to solve for the y, that becomes an eigenvalue problem. And of course, this is the global problem. That's where everybody else talks to each other to become consistent. So after I solve this by alternating, I have an, a set of consistent functional maps. And this really makes a difference because if I think about transporting, say, the functional, the map, the, the function capturing in this cow to this cows, if I only, if I don't use cycle consistency, I just, I just use descriptor preservation and the regularization, what I get is pretty garbage. I mean, it's not very good. But the moment I put cycle consistency in, it becomes much, much better. This is a very strong condition, the cycle of consistency. It reminds me of a, a quote from Leo Tolstoy's Alan Karenina that uh, all happy families are happy in the same way, but every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. So essentially, all these errors are kind of inconsistent. They don't support each other. And the moment you force consistency, they become much more the same. Uh, once we have this uh, network of transporters, the question is how can we use that to find the cows? Well, the cows is what is preserved by the network, right? I mean, we would like, if we've done things right, if fi is an indicator function of a cow, the cow in image i, and if I map it by xij, to find where the cow is in image fj. In other words, we're looking for fixed points of the network, functions, one per image, that are preserved by the functional maps. And so this gives us another optimization problem. Notice now the XIJs are fixed. They were found by the previous optimization. Now we are solving for the FIs. And we have the second term to align better these uh, functions with image boundaries. This is a classical a normalized cut score based on the graph Laplacian. So we have this joint optimization that we solve to look for fixed points. And it turns out this works quite well. And, and we tested it on a number of data sets. I think because I'm running out of time, I will uh, skip some of the statistics. Although, as you can see here, it would work better than techniques that are supervised. And this is completely unsupervised. Uh, let me not spend time on that. Instead, I will show you examples. Uh, 
I show five images per class. The network was built on about 20 or 30 images, like a very small number. And I show them the cosegmentations found by the network. Again, these are all with the same parameters. There was no tuning whatsoever between the different examples. I think this dog one is interesting because both the background and the dogs look quite different. And the fact that you can actually extract the dogs from such different and sparse data, I think is quite interesting. Uh, now, the, what I just showed you was the case of a single entity per image. Of course, in general, there are multiple interesting entities per image. And it's an extension of this work that now, in addition to estimating where an entity is in the image, it has to estimate which entities are in the image. Uh, I'm going to go over this very quickly because time is running short. But at the top level, it's quite similar. We start with input images. We optimize for consistent functional maps between them. And then we have essentially this optimization problem that has a continuous aspect, namely to find where the entities are in the images, and also a discrete aspect to find which are the entities here in the images. So this is a bit more complicated this time. And I'll very briefly describe what is different. The first part is the same, modular the fact that not every entity appears in every image. So basically, we cannot have perfect cycle closure. The cycle closure has to be restricted to the uh, entities that are present in all the images of the cycle. That is, some of these maps will be non-total. And again, the optimization will have a discrete aspect, namely, which are the entities contained in each image, and a continuous aspect, where are these entities in the image. So here I show an example of images, and here I have entities like the, the fruit basket, that appears in all these images, the girl with the blue shirt that appears in these two, the girl with the pink that appears here and here, and then the baby that appears here and here. And the network has to figure that out. And so again, it alternates between a continuous optimization that tries to optimize where the known classes are in each image, and a combinatorial optimization that tries to decide which are the classes that should be present in each image. Um, this is what the continuous optimization looks like, and it's uh, very much the same as before. We want to, you know, given the XIJs, we want to find indicator functions that are consistent with the maps and consistent with uh, segmentation cues. The new term here is this that says for different entities, the corresponding functions should be orthogonal. That is, they should not use the same pixels to indicate the entity. Now you may say, well, this is a, a quartic term. How do you deal with it in the optimization? And yes, this is difficult. And what we do is we fix all of the S's except one, optimize for that, and then alternate to the other S's. But I will not discuss details. This is the combinatorial optimization, where essentially, if a image I does not contain class K, but if its neighbors do, then we push the neighbors uh, the, the, the neighbor functions for class K to the image I, combine them, and at the same time try to stay consistent with uh, uh, segmentation cues in the orthogonality condition that I mentioned. So essentially, as the iteration proceeds, each image ga gains more and more classes, and also the uh, segmentation functions for each class in each image get improved. And again, uh, due to shortness of time, let me skip some of the tables and just show some examples. Here, different colors indicate the different classes. And you can see it's not perfect, for example, it missed the legs of this guy. And in general, because we are using only a small number of eigenfunctions, it is not easy to represent a global structure, I mean, very thin things like legs and so on. Okay, let me finish by indicating how this works also in 3D. For example, here I show a segmentation of a whole bunch of vases into consistent parts. And again, we start by building a network um, based on some similarity metric. Here we use the Lidoo uh, uh, 
distance list program descriptor. Um, and then we start here with some noisy functional maps. I will not discuss how they are computed. You uh, start with some traditional mapping method and then lift it to functional space. Again, we optimize for cycle consistency, being aware that now not ev every cycle can be fully consistent because not every object has all the same, the same parts. And then we essentially use uh, this cleanup step I will explain to make the maps consistent, to synchronize them. And from that we extract consistent basis functions across the, the chaos and the tables, the subjects. Here the optimization is like this. Again, I'll be very brief. Uh, this is the preservation of the functional constraints as shown here. And a term that tries to give us low rank now, rank is not a convex criterion, so we use the usual trick of, of replacing that with uh, the trace norm, the sum of the singular values. And then once we extract the xij's from this, we try to factorize them in this imperfect form with the Penrose inverse, while also staying compatible with uh, orthogonality constraints. And this will give us the desired latent spaces, essentially the the parts that correspond across the shapes. So again, this is this kind of factorization we discussed before. That uh, so we recover essentially a low rank matrix from noisy measurements of its entries, the initial functional correspondences, this Y matrix encode shared structure across the shapes, and uh, this also uh, simplifies storing all these uh, maps because essentially we don't need to store the maps, we just need to store the Y matrices and then any particular map we derive by taking the product of one Y here with one pseudo inverse here. So you've seen this before, this is a, a collection of, uh, actually, actually a pretty large collection of chairs, say, uh, tables and so on. Uh, and by using this technique, we can actually compute a consistent segmentation using a Markov random field approach on each uh, shape independently. And again, I think this is what I was mentioning earlier, that the structure arises from the network. The network discovers the shared parts because that is the most efficient way for it to factorize the, the maps between the shapes. Another small interesting aspect here is uh, how to deal with large collections. Uh, we had about 8,000 shares. It's hard to do the global optimization on all of them. So we broke it into groups of chairs and computed sort of an abstraction per group and then repeated the approach on the abstractions for three levels. This is kind of interesting because of course here you have uh, normal maps to start with, but once you abstract these chairs into a latent object and this chairs into a latent object, how do you compute a map at this level? Because these are not real chairs now. These are these functional spaces. It turns out you can do so you can evaluate this map by saying pick a chair here, pick a chair here, and route the map between them first up to the latent object, then across to the other side, and then down. And this should agree with the direct map. And this way you can supervise the second level functional maps and so on. So this kind of a hierarchy of abstractions built on top of the underlying objects. Okay, uh, I'm running out of time. So let me finish with a more philosophical comment here. I think you're all familiar with things like um, image mosaic, where you have multiple views of the same scene and you can stitch them together to form a panorama, or maybe a uh, slump, where you take multiple scans and stitch them together to get a 3D model of the environment. Well, what we are doing here is not so different. We are actually, by synchronizing these functional maps, we're effectively building a latent object Plato's cow, it's not an image, it's not a 3D model, it's a vector space that has the consistent parts coming from all these images. It sort of you know, records in what way these images are the same. It sort of summarizes the sameness. So in that sense, it's exactly like a reconstruction from different views of an object. Here is a reconstruction of the cow class from different views of the different cows. And uh, there's a concept in homological algebra called a, a collimit. A collimit is an object that can represent a collection of objects 
with respect to its uh, maps to other objects. So for example, if I'm mapping a cow to a table, I mean, that doesn't make so much sense because they are very different, but still they have some similar structure. They have four legs, right? Well, clearly the details of this cow don't really matter when I'm comparing it uh, to a table because uh, this is very, very different. So whether I map this cow to the table directly or whether I take this cow, I go to the latent cow and then map the latent cow to the table, those two, that composition will be very close to the best I can do in mapping this cow to the table. And so essentially, this, this synchronization creates this latent object that can represent the entire collection that I started from with respect to other collections that perhaps have similar structure, but can be visually very different. Okay, it's time to end. Uh, in summary, I talked about functional maps that generalize normal maps and provide a compact representation of correspondences between data sets, whether these are images or 3D models. And I tried to demonstrate that functional maps can act as powerful information transporters. And then when we link them into functional map networks, the synchronization, the invariance that going from X to Y between different paths should yield the same result, or cycle closure coming back to where I started should yield the identity. This provides very strong supervision that enables us to purify and denoise the maps. And finally, out of such consistent functional map networks, we get shared latent spaces that somehow seem to capture uh, semantic structure in the data in completely unsupervised ways. So, I will stop here and uh, thank you very much. <laughs>